You're listening to WPEA 90.5 FM. This is Big Red Radio. I'm Avi Kwadifkar, here with my co-hosts. I am Carter Otis. Charlie Scales. And we are here to discuss some philosophy on the School of Athens. So, uh, Charlie, you, you prepared for this meeting, so, so tell us, what are we, we going to be talking about for the next hour? We're going to be talking about the pre-Socratics, so a lot of y'all know about Socrates. He said, uh, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. Mm. Pretty fire. Um, so, but the people before him, I think, uh, very important to think about because uh, they influenced him a lot. Um, and uh, I think we're just going to start at the beginning, basically, where uh, a lot of people say, you know, Western philosophy began. And that's with Thales of Miletus in 624 BC, where he's born and then, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Thales. Yeah, yeah. So you said Western philosophy started now? That's right. This, they, uh, they call Thales the father of mathematics as well as the father of philosophy. Um, he was the first to have a mathematical thing named after him. Um, I think it's important, though, to say that he himself was um, a very learned man in the uh, geometry of the Egyptians and Babylonians because he himself had went to Egypt uh, to study geometry. Um, the difference... Of him and and the Egyptian mathematics was that he started questioning why does this work? Why does math describe these physical things so perfectly? And he basically started this uh, system of proofs that defines the Hellenistic, um, basically all of Greek culture after this point. You know, we think about like later philosophers start to think about what is virtue. Hmm. This all starts with someone asking these questions about a mathematical concept that he learned in Egypt. So, uh, you know, the builders of the pyramids, right, the most advanced mathematicians of the time, and they were just concerned with how it looks. And that's kind of a similar trend with the Romans, uh, just kind of concerned with what works and what doesn't. Thales takes it one step further and says, why does it work? That's actually an interesting distinction you brought up, um, where you mentioned that Thales kind of invented math. Right. And nowadays, like there's this huge debate about whether math is discovered or invented. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess in Thales perspective, since he was, you know, inventing it, um, he had a certain perspective. Uh, You mentioned what he started questioning, like why exactly mathematics measures kind of nature so well. I mean, that's an interesting distinction that we can, you know, today it's a different issue. I think that's something a lot of people forget is that we created the system of mathematics to describe reality and it's not as if it's something inherent to reality or maybe that's a matter of opinion i don't know Mm. i mean mm -hmm. regardless um thales theorem for for our listeners who you know heard that little bit about oh he was the first guy to have a math thing named after him um for all our geometry fellows uh thales theorem is when you uh when you bisect a or when you draw a diameter against uh, through a circle, and then you uh, choose one point on that circle, and you make a triangle where the uh, where the where one of the sides of the triangle is the diameter of the circle, and the other two sides are the endpoints of the diameter connecting to a third random point. Uh, Thales's theorem is that it creates a right angled triangle. Mm, yes, that one I remember perfectly. And <laughs> yes, interesting. I mean, regardless, um, Charlie, you talked about kind of the Egyptians and the Babylonians um, and I guess some of his mathematical beliefs. But you did mention we're not here to talk about math. We're talk- here to talk about philosophy. That's right. Um, so Thales, um, at this point, philosophy is, and it's basically throughout most of history at this, uh, you know, until very recently, philosophy was the science. It was how you describe the natural world. All ecologists were philosophers. You would um, study the natural world to try to understand how it works. And, um, you know, a lot of these early philosophers, you'll, you'll talk, you'll, you'll hear them talk about how the way things are is because it is natural and therefore it is good because the gods ordained it. So, I mean, if the gods made it this way, why would it not be perfect and therefore natural? So uh, when, when we say philosopher, I mean, we're really talking about anything from, you know, a linguist to a 
thinker, right? Where you're, you're wondering what is being, but also physicists were philosophers at this point. So then, I mean, philosophers were kind of like the everyman, right? When, when it comes to thought and when it comes to um, study, I think yes. At least in the Greek world. At least in the Greek. I mean, about the Greek world, you mentioned something about um, what gods, I mean, this Thales, what, what was Thales' perspective on gods? Because I know that gods had some kind of, well, a pretty huge contribution to philosophy in terms of, oh, they made us and they made our world and the world is good and all of that. So Thales actually is uh, one of the people that kind of breaks the mold and, and one of the first people to do so. Um, he, up to this point, I mean, and, you know, long after him, people believe that the gods directly made people um, through whatever means various, you know, people groups come up with, but the gods directly created humans. And what Thales says, he's basically the first non-creationist in the sense that he says human beings came from water, um, that we directly evolved out of water instead of some divine um, uh, providence and I think that's a big distinction in Thales' uh, view because it's kind of a large step for philosophy. Wait, water, that's fascinating. So like everything was made of this one substance. Weren't there supposed to be like four elements? Mm -hmm. So the four elements. The pre-Socratics are generally defined by their use of the four elements. That is fire, earth, air, and water. And arguing over what or how much they constitute humans, right? Some people would say earth more. Some people would say water, like Thales. Uh, Anaximander, one of Thales' students, he was the first one to um, kind of combine these and say, what if we are made of fire and water? So um, basically all these, all these uh, pre-Socratics are, are just furthering this idea that um, the elements constitute all things and therefore humans. And the debate mainly is over what elements and, and to what extent. And so Thales was, sorry, Aximander, you just brought up his name, the, this Thales student. So like he studied under Thales. Did he share like his philosophy? I mean, you mentioned, oh, Aximander brought in fire and water, right? Yes, he uh, he's a founder of a philosophical philosophical school, um, and he uh, actually his first major um, philosophical uh, breakthrough was um, what a lot of people call the first theory of evolution. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. bit of a stretch to say, but um, he argued that humans were born of fish, not in an, not in an evolutionary way, but because. When the fish went onto water, it was deemed unnatural. So the ones that had the traits that did not align mm -hmm. eventually died out. So a kind of primitive form of natural selection. But it's a, it's a fascinating philosophical idea that, that um, humans instead came from a primitive form into a perfect and natural one. So then we were not like created. Actually, wait. So did Aximander hold that same belief as Thales that like the gods didn't consciously create us? Yes. Okay. So then like we kind of some something evolved out of what fire and water and then evolved into what we are. I believe so. I think his uh his his idea was was it was fish and then um you know he was proven right by by uh Darwin, but um, I think it's kind of interesting to think that you know he was this. Super preeminent uh, mm -hmm. philosopher, philosopher on this idea. Well, I guess it's also important to remember that, right? That like, like you say, he was proved right <clears throat> by Darwin, but like, it's not that he had any evidence, right? It right. was kind of just a just a guess, right? Like, I mean, we know clearly now that people didn't evolve out of water, out of H two O. That like, mm -hmm. but I think that at this point, it's more more important than the the science of it is to say that like the the religion of it or the the philosophy of it to say like maybe we don't come from something greater maybe you know we aren't anything beyond our biology i mean carter you do mention that um oh what that it was just a guess but like you gotta admit that's a pretty good guess yeah i mean it's it's 
I don't know. I I I, I don't know how, how how solid of a guess that is. I mean, it, the guess that like things come from water. It's I think it's more fascinating. Like you know, clearly not accurate by modern standards. I think the thing that's more fascinating isn't how accurate it is, but that he had the willpower and the daring to make a conjecture that was outside of what was known at the time, like outside of the theistic argument to say, you know, maybe there isn't anything supernatural. So this uh this joke the other day, which was like, oh. you know, the Greek philosophers weren't that smart, actually. They were just first. Right. Mm. Which, you know, I don't know if that's actually true, but regardless. They <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's first, hard to know, first. but yeah. Right. I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, even the simplest person nowadays has an idea of evolution and, you know, black holes. So, right. Kind of hard to say. Oh, we love black holes. We do love black holes. Mm, yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, the person today obviously knows a lot more than, than you know, anyone a hundred or a thousand years ago would have, right? The average intelligence of a person, at least, you know, in terms of knowledge or hard knowledge, facts right. is much higher. Yeah. So, I mean, um, what you mentioned that, uh, you know, Thales was our first philosopher. Does Aximander, is Aximander our second philosopher then? Uh, it's Anaximander. Anaximander. I'm so sorry. No, you're good. Um, you know what? I think that that's the general narrative. Um, mm. There weren't, there wasn't a, mu- a great amount of time between him and our next person, which was Heraclitus. Um, mm. But I, th- I do think that, that by uh, proxy generally, Anaximander would be the second philosopher. Um, I'm going to fact check that though. Quick fact check. Um, but I mean, in the meantime, Aximander, or sorry, not Aximander, but Heraclitus. I mean, what was his, what were his claims to fame? Heraclitus, uh, known as the weeping philosopher. Oh, sad guy. Yeah. Oh, he's no. actually in the school of Athens. If you look at the painting by Raphael, he's on the stairs, um, weeping head and hands. Um, and he basically, uh, he believed that the universe was constantly in motion. Mm. So, and this kind of challenges a lot of other people at the time. Um, he's the one that had the quote, you know, a man can never, never step in the same river twice because it is not the same river and he is not the same man. Mm, and so, interesting, interesting. So, yeah, so he, he defines this concept of logos, um, which is actually a Stoic ideal. Um, if you uh, remember our discussion on Stoicism, those uh, dedicated fans. Um, <laughs> Logos is basically a collective uh, force in the universe that binds opposites together. And that's actually kind of revolutionary at this point because, you know, fire and water, how could you expect them to coalesce and to interact? His argument, his thought process was that, well, if hot things become cold and cold things become hot, how could opposites be separate? And so there must be some force, some um, means by which these opposites come together and intermingle and thus exchange properties. And a lot of other people were completely opposed to this. And, and uh, it was uh, kind of, you know, reshaped the way a lot of people saw the world um, at, this t- at this point. Yeah, that's very interesting. Another parallel of a philosopher who, you know, made a scientific conjecture that was, you know, more or less, you know, headed in the right direction, but was also a step outside what was typically known. Um, I wanted to go back and talk about this river a little bit because, you know, we, we talked about this this quote, but see if you can explain a little more. I mean, Carter, I'd love to. And welcome back. You're listening to The School of Athens on WPEA 90.5 FM. I'm your host, Avi Kwadifer. I am Carter Otis. And I'm Charlie Scales. All right. Well, Carter, I mean, I think you left us off somewhere right on a cliffhanger, actually. So to go back to the quote, just to read it again, a man can never step in the same river twice because it is not the same river and he's not the same man. So this seems like a departure from a lot of at least, you know, what... Western philosophy is, you know, we we use the word river, like, you know, we don't we don't change the word based on the river that flows, right? We call the river the same river. So I I don't know. I guess uh, could one of you, you know, maybe explain that a little bit more, right? I still call myself Carter, even though I'm a different Carter than before. You know, how does that work? I think 
from Herac- from Heraclitus' standpoint, and um, this is kind of backed by some other things, but that throughout time, your experiences in the world will advance. They will evolve, and you will evolve with them. For instance, look back a year ago. Think about how much you've changed in just a year. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Would you yeah. have made the same decisions a year ago? I hope not. Would you? I know, right? <laughs> you know, some of us are that are younger are thinking, you know, of course not. Why would I have ever done, you know, because that's the nature of humans. We are constantly changing. And that's his um, kind of idea that the universe changes with us. Another kind of interesting way to think about this is that, you know, in the human body, every atom will be in you will be replaced in a period of time. I believe seven years. Seven years. Like Over seven years, every single atom inside of your body will be replaced by a new atom. Right. You are not made of the same stuff that you were made of seven years ago. Mm-mm. That seem, stuff is elsewhere in the universe. I seem to remember uh, almost a Greek problem that was like this that we talked about a little earlier. Something about a ship. Something about Theseus' mm-hmm. ship. Mm-hmm. Yes, Theseus' ship. Right. If you If you replace... All the all the parts on a ship is it still the same ship, right? If you completely replace everything, is it still the same ship? Is there still an identity to it, right? And I think what you're saying is true, but I think that this quote is more about the internal rather than you know the physical externals of a person. That you know, if if you change your character so much, you know, I, like at what point are you still the same person? You know, can you ever be a truly changed person? So I mean, according to Heraclitus, he's saying, oh, everything's in flux, right? Man can never seem to set river. The river is constantly mm-hmm. changing. The man is constantly changing. Um, by that token, there's actually another philosophy very similar to this around the same time. Um, and it is on the other side of the world, actually. Oh? Buddhist philosophies. Actually, it's not around the same time. Buddhism came a little later. It was quite, quite a bit later. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was still yeah. existing at that time. So, oh, not, What, really? Buddhism? Not oh, no, not, not in BC. It was Buddhism like after was... Alexander the Great. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the Buddha, the, that guy. I think we do have historical like dates for him. Yeah. Like Hinduism, it's harder to pin down, but Buddhism, no, oh, we got him. My yeah. apologies on that one. Actually, what? Well, mm. We've got a general idea of Regardless. Hinduism. Anyways. Uh, so the, the point I was getting at um, is that Buddhism has a very similar, uh, a very similar idea in flux, in the like, ever-changing idea of things. And actually, a lot of Eastern... Uh, a lot of Eastern religions and Eastern philosophies share this idea of oh, everything is in flux, everything is in constant change. And uh, Carter, you and I should be a little familiar with some of these Eastern religions. Yes, yes. Again, another plug for a religion class. Yes, mysticism. Th- this take, one, take mysticism. mysticism. Mysticism, religion. I forget what number it is, but regardless, uh, I do too. It is uh, five sixty-five. 565. So for all our Exonians listening in, take religion 565. Um, but regardless, uh, for all our non-Exonians listening in, Carter, can you sum up in a word what mysticism is? In a word? That's kind of tough. In a sentence, maybe? Take All right, take as much sentences as you need. Take um, as many words as you need. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the idea that instead of, you know, one higher power per se, that, you know, that there is a higher power kind of within all of us, right? So in uh, in certain Chinese philosophies, in Taoism, for example, that there is the Tao or the way that is kind of like that it is the universe, that we are all composed of the universe and that you know, we are ever changing, that mm-hmm. there isn't necessarily a self, that everything is made of the universe. A lot of big ideas, all many of which we'll be able to discuss a little bit in, uh, well, in a future episode. So stay tuned for that. But regardless, mm-hmm. I just wanted to give a brief little shout out to Buddhism, some similar, uh, a similar, you know, uh, thought process that's been going on in the world, completely separated from Heraclitus. I mean, about Charlie, what you brought up with, you know, the same you changing from point to point, from moment to moment. Can we say that we keep the same identity? Like, what does it mean to be the same person? That's a loaded question. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, certainly quite loaded. I mean, like I said before, I still call myself carter right right and i if i was referring to five-year-old me i would say carter because that was you know the same physical body or i guess not because it's been at least seven years 
right? Right. So I mean, is that is that is a younger me is like a five year old me the same me, or different or or close? Like how how are how are those two selves related? I think it's that's kind of what Heraclitus is trying to you know get at, right? It's that we don't know how much you've changed. We don't know if you're the same person. If you ask the same person in different points of time, different questions are going to answer differently. If you look at their brains, they're going to be different. They're going to have different memories, different experiences. Some, sometimes there's memory loss involved. And so to say, you know, you can say I have the same name, right? You can say I have the same genetics, mm-hmm. a lot of the same cells, like, you know, brain cells. To say you're the same person, mm-hmm. that's to say that you would act the same, I think. That's true. Yeah, I agree. You say that you'd act the same and also that you've had no new experiences. You haven't learned anything. I mean, even on the most boring of days, we all learn thousands of things mm. from that one day. Right. And you know, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, you'll get, you'll get that phone call and say, you know, I've changed. <laughs> <laughs> a lot Sometimes, of times. Take me back. A lot. <laughs> take me I'm back. different. I'm different. <laughs> That's a problem. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, I guess, I guess, I don't know that, that, makes me think about putting this idea into practicality, right? If everyone is ever changing and they're, they're never exactly the same as they were years ago, uh, what effect might this have on, say, criminal justice, right? Especially, you know, when, when people are, are put into prison for a number of years, right? For things, bad things they did in the past. Is there, is there ever any chance of, of them say, like, you know, I think a lot of people will, or a lot of prisoners will say, like, you know, that they're, they're a changed person or that, you know, they've, they've come to respect people more. They've come to understand what they did wrong. So is there, is there any, you know, way that we can parallel this into, into a field like criminal justice and to say, like, well, these, you know, these people have changed? Well, I mean, what's the goal? And I, I think, Carter, we talked about justice a couple of shows back, mm. but it's almost like, what is the goal of the criminal justice system? Is it to actually, rehabilitate or is it to punish because if it's to punish then it really doesn't matter how much they change but if it's to rehabilitate then we should be focusing all our efforts on rehabilitation into quote-unquote healthy societal members whatever they that may look like mm-hmm. and i guess i mean i would wonder as well like there's there's no way as charlie said before there's no way to like quantify what has changed right like there's no way to say like oh, I've I've changed five changes like you know, speak for yourself. I will measure every single one of your atoms. Right, like there's no way there's no way to understand how much a person has changed. Like I can tell, right? As Charlie said again, I'm different than I was a year ago. Right, I would make different decisions. A lot of the same decisions, but I would make slightly different decisions. Um, but I can't tell you exactly how and exactly why. I just know that I've I've changed. I've grown, but I can't tell you in what way. So I think it's it's also just hard to quantify that. Yeah, and I think talking about criminal justice, it's really dangerous when you get into the, you know, ship of Theseus and criminal justice. You know, that you, you haven't imprisoned the same person. If, mm. they, if they've been in jail That's for true. over seven years, you have not imprisoned the same person as you, as you put in. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, in the terms of, I think that a lot of criminal, a lot of incarceration is based on you want to prevent this person from doing anything again. And in a lot of ways, <laughs> including brain chemistry mm-hmm. and uh, past experiences, those that person is going to be the same. Mm. And so I think like the the judge isn't really looking at a philosophical kind of um, worldview in this in this scenario because if you did, it would be very dangerous, mm-hmm. and it might get a lot of people hurt. So I think it's it's, it's interesting to think about, but um, we have to remember the real world sometimes when thinking about philosophy. You're telling me philosophy isn't about the real world, Charlie? Right. I think exactly. it's a little cranial sometimes. I think no, you can get this, a little up this there. Is a, this is a callback. I think to like our <laughs> second episode on free will where yeah. we talked about, you know, if, if we have no free will, what does that mean for the justice system as well? You know, if people, if people change, if people you know, really do change, if they're not the same person that they were, you know, what, what is, ramifications does that have? And I mean, similar to what we said, we talked about free will. That would really almost necessitate an entire overhaul of what our criminal justice system is now. And uh, like Avik said, a reevaluation of what the goal is of criminal justice. You know, is it to rehabilitate? Is it to punish? Is it to keep society safe from bad people? The, uh, you know, there are, there are multiple different answers and different people will tell you different things. So I think that that's part of the idea is that, you know, we need to come to a greater understanding of what the purpose is. Hmm. Well, I mean, 
we can have a, an hour long discussion here. And we pretty much have over the span of several podcasts. Um, but regardless, I think we do have to, well, we have a couple other philosophers to talk about, pre-Socratic philosophers. Oh, of course. Calling let's all the let's way keep back. it moving. Charlie, what's up next? So we were on uh, Her- Heraclitus, and I think a great place to go from there is Parmenides, someone who basically said the opposite thing, that the universe is one thing, it is static, and it is in balance. Everything that exists does not change in any way. Um, they lived at the same time, and they hated each other. Mm. <laughs> and uh, he was Parmenides. Uh, concerned with being and existence. Talked about it all the time. Uh, unfortunately, I do not know a lot about Parmenides, though. So, I mean, we could talk about it a little bit. Interesting. I guess that that, that is puzzling to me. I wonder you know, what would Parmenides say? You know, that there's there's no change in the world seems pretty strong, right? Yeah. Well, yeah it what seems would, a little ignorant, isn't it? Right, yeah. I don't know. I guess... Charlie, you're the you're the expert. What would I'm not the expert. What, you're the regional expert in this room? Oh gosh. What would Parmenides say? Let's say if you know there was a vase sitting on a shelf and then it fell and broke, right? That's a change, right? Like, I don't know. Would would Parmenides have a response to that, or you know, what, what would he say? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. I feel like it's more about the idea that like the everything being static is more. Um, you know, there are representations that the world looks like to us, but like the world itself isn't going anywhere. You know, the like the, the maxim, oh, ener- neither energy nor matter can be destroyed. Not true, but whatever. Um, <laughs> neither energy nor matter can be destroyed. I mean, I feel like it kind of falls into what Parmenides is saying, which is that the universe's energy content doesn't change. Its matter content doesn't change. It may look a little different, but like ultimately nothing's being destroyed. Nothing's being created. It's static. It's in balance. It's all like one thing. Yeah, and I think uh, he describes a kind of like truth, a way of truth called the Althea, um, which describes change as superficial, uh, describes it as visual and uh, this other um, opinion about the world is called the doxa or opinion, um, basically based on anecdotal evidence. See like, oh, the base broke, right? But like what you're saying, it's a world of appearances in which sensory faculties lead to conceptions which are false. Like that, you know, the vase has changed in some way when no, it is it is the same vase, but in a different place, which, you know, in a, in a different <laughs> form, I guess. In that, a different form. That's, that's <laughs> and, interesting. And it's the, hard to talk about, you know, without contradicting yourself, which is something I'm trying to grapple with. Actually, no, I think <laughs> the issue is like our language. I'm pretty sure Parmenides talked about like oh once you say something is you can't say it will be or it was or like it'll change because then you're attributing like that kind of you know a change to something that has a certain amount of being right and it talks you know when we were talking about identity like oh carter is carter will be carter was um we talked about you know how people's uh how people's perspectives how what they are uh their physical and their mental states how that affects uh you know how they're described and their identity and so we talked about all these different parts of who a person is, and we kind of came to the conclusion that, oh, like, um, you know, your name is just a label, right? A convenient, a label for convenience. And I feel like we can make the same claim here, where like a vase is just a label for convenience. You break it. I mean, all the parts are still there. You can put it back together. It's still a vase. It's not like glued back together. Sure, it's not in the same form, but the vase is still there. That's true. I mean, we still call it a puzzle, whether or not it's in the box or it's put mm. together. Um, but I feel like that's a little bit ignorant of the practicality, right? Like once your vase is broken, it's, you could still call it a vase, but like, it's hard to use it for like holding flowers. I, I, whatever you use vases for other than breaking. This is philosophy, Carter. We're not, th- <laughs> we're not talking about practice. We're talking about theory. Oh, perfect. <laughs> no practice. All right. Yes. Then, then that works perfectly, right? If you still have all the pieces to the vase, even if you don't have them, they still exist, right? All the atoms that once made up the vase still exist somewhere. So. I mean, I guess, yeah, you could you could say that the vase still exists. It's just in a different form. Its form is now spread out across the floor. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's Parmenides. I think the uh, the whole monism, and by the way, that's that's a term for this kind of philosophy, monoism, um, which is like everything is one thing. Different monoists have different interpretations, um, but the the actually the opposite of monoism or not the opposite but another idea is the idea of 
dualism, which is actually entirely un- or pretty unrelated from what Parmenides was talking about. Mm. Um, it's a more modern philosophy thing, but it's the idea that we are not only matter, but we are soul question mark we are consciousness we're like something else other than matter there's something in us like that makes us conscious that makes us feel things Mm -hmm. that makes us experience that's more that can be described by atoms and more than that can be described by the physicality of things right i've i've heard that summed up as you know a human is greater than the sum of its parts Mm -hmm. right that you know we are more than just the things that make us up that there's some internal spirituality or something like that that makes us different than just if you assembled the same atoms in the same arrangement as a person yeah i think it's most commonly called the uh, or referred to as the the mind body dualism Mm. anyways more more modern philosophy which again we can talk about i don't think we've had a show on consciousness at least mind body as of yet we've had some similar stuff uh but regardless as it's standing it does appear to be that time again and so oh my we gosh, will be back. We have to go to another break. And welcome back. You're listening to the School of Athens. This is WPEA 90.5 FM Exeter. I'm your host, Ave Guadavkar, along with my co hosts. I am Carter Otis. I'm Charlie Scales. Now, Charlie, we just left off on Parmenides, and we were about to start up with another one of our favorite pre Socratic philosophers. Who we got next? We got Zeno of Elea. Ooh, Zeno. Oh, wow. Is that spelled with an X or a Z? So the Z. Mm. So pretty cool. Well, I mean, wouldn't it have been spelt in, in Greek? It would have so been spelt. So it's yeah. all just like well, it was a Zeta. It would have been spelt with a Zeta. Yeah. Zeta. Okay. Buddy. <laughs> Man. Right, fine. <laughs> Anyways, what, what's Introduce. Zeno got for us? Zeno's got a lot of paradoxes is what he got. So he's okay. a man of math. Um, mm-hmm. Man of infinity also. Uh, you know. Um, uh, I like to consider myself a man of infinity. So I'm going to ask you, Carter. Have you ever walked? Yes, yes. Have you ever walked any distance? Yes, that I've also done. Greater than, have it, has it taken you a greater, a less than infinite time? Yeah, it, like I've, I've thought of a place to go and I've gone there in less than infinity minutes, yes. You, you have completed the journey? I completed the journey. So Zeno there. would say that is false. Oh, that You really? haven't <laughs> done that. Oh, what have I done, Zeno? You have, well, first of all, when you get up and... Try to go to that place. Mm-hmm. In order to walk the hole, you need to walk half of the hole. Am I wrong? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you walk half of the hole, in order to complete the other half, you have to then complete a quarter of that half. Right? Am I right? Right. Right. Half of the next half. Right? Exactly. If, if there's a wall that's 20 feet away, I walk 10 feet. Right? And then I have to walk another 5 feet. Right. And, and in order to complete the remaining quarter, you have to walk an eighth. Mm, mm-hmm. You have to do it. It's it's a remaining part of the distance. Mm, right. And so on. It's to a 16th, to a 32nd, 64th, whatever. What he says, how can anyone go anywhere if every time we move, we have to walk? And it's not even a matter of opinion. You are walking every smaller increment up until that infinite sum, right? Mm. That is your destination. And I've I've heard this rephrased as well as like let's say you have a cup and I have you know a bunch of water I'll fill your cup halfway and then I'll fill that empty half halfway and keep filling the empty half halfway will I ever completely fill your cup? I mean I remember this was in this vein of thinking there was also something about um, Achilles and a tortoise mm-hmm. I mean instead of it, it was kind of similar in that um, you know you you have to get. Well, Zeno's the the running paradox is oh you have to get halfway and then you get halfway again then you get halfway again. It's kind of similar in that like um, you're you're you have a race between Achilles and a tortoise. Um, for those for those uh, uninitiated, I guess in Greek mythology, I don't know if Achilles counts as Greek mythology. Um, I think the Iliad, yeah, I think it would be. Regardless, um, Achilles wasn't. I don't. I don't think he was a running type. I think he was just a famous. He was pretty guy. fast. He was pretty fast. That's that's like whole thing. Really? I thought being strong was this whole thing. It was being strong, being fast, being a ch- child of the gods, all that, you know. Except for the heel. Yeah, that was a, that was a rough spot. Forget that part. That's not important. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it is not important because here he's doing a foot race with a tortoise um, where the, the tortoise actually gets a head start. And tor- tortoises are notoriously slow and Achilles is notoriously fast. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you start the race, the tortoise has a head start. Um, and uh, immediately as they start, 
the tortoise gets a certain distance and Achilles catches up to where the tortoise was, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say the tortoise was, I mean, I'll put some numbers to it for the more, more mathematical Yeah, yeah sure. People. It's a 100-meter it's a dash. It's a 100-meter dash. Tortoise gets a 10-meter head start, and Achilles is 10 times faster than the tortoise. Sure. All right. Like so um, Achilles gets to where the tortoise was at 10 meters. The tortoise has gone one meter ahead because, you know, it's just, that's just how time works, right? Mm -hmm. And the time that Achilles took to catch up to where the tortoise was, the tortoise has moved a little because the tortoise is actually moving. And then Achilles has to catch up that one meter. And the tortoise passes 0.1 meters. And right. then Achilles has to catch up to that 0.1 meter. And then the tortoise catches up to the 0.11 meter. And Achilles has to keep catching up to the tortoise. But every time he does, the tortoise moves just a little bit ahead. So Achilles can't ever catch up to the tortoise, right? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like this, this seems to be like you know very confusingly framed to make it seem like, oh, he'll never catch the tortoise. I mean... To bring in yet another parallel to this that Avik, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of, <laughs> is that this often comes up with rocket launches, right? If we say we need to launch this rocket, you know, if we need to launch, you know, this 500 pound rocket, then we need 100 pounds of fuel. Well, if we add 100 pounds of fuel, that makes it a 600 pound rocket. So to launch that extra 100 pounds, we need fuel to launch the fuel. Then we need fuel to launch the fuel that's launching the fuel, right? But yeah, lock it, rockets you know launch all the time. Other than you know Tesla or SpaceX is you know recently weren't, weren't well, so no, successful. Well, no, hold on, hold on. Uh -oh. They launched, all right. Okay, okay. They got up they, in the air. They, they got, just they, got need to go where they, they need just to go. underwent <laughs> a. Um, I, I forget how it was put. I think they underwent a rapid, unscheduled disassembly mm. um, in the air. It was inconvenient, but their goal was to get off. The I think that's rapid. what happens to my mental health around finals. They get a rapid, <laughs> unscheduled disassembly. But um, how do they launch rockets then? You know, if they keep have to add fuel to account for the weight of the fuel that was added in the step before, how, how come they ever get to launching? Well, lucky us. Um, there are little, there are a couple of mathematical tricks that just oh, happen up to fall math. out. Math. We love math. Do we love math? I love math, man. Math is kind of great. It's philosophy. Is, it is just philosophy, really. Take abstract algebra if y'all can. Um, this I is, cannot. <laughs> I, I do not have enough time. Uh, at, 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 any, at any point in your life, and this is to all our listeners, take abstract algebra. Uh, if you're into math, if you're not into math, it doesn't matter. It'll revolutionize how you think about math because it's crazy. Regardless, um, going all the way back to how math applies, well, with your rocketry example, Carter, the math just so happens to work out that there's eventually a tipping point in which the amount of fuel we need catches up to the amount of fuel we need for the fuel, the amount of fuel we need for the fuel, for the fuel, for the fuel, for the fuel, etc. Um, eventually, it's like, you know, we just don't, we don't just blow up into infinity. There is a tipping point. It's crazy. It's uh, something around like 20 times the original capacity. Uh, but there is a point in which we have enough fuel to launch a rocket and all the fuel itself. Um, and just like that, math has solved our problem. And then we come to the runner's paradox and the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. And then we come to the cup paradox. And we find, I think, you know, math actually can solve some of these problems for us as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think any, any Exeter student, at least, that's in the middle of calculus or approaching calculus will recognize this with the use of limits, right? But I think, you know, anyone can kind of see this concept. If you have a piece of paper and you cut it in half and then you take that half and you cut it in half, you, you'll keep doing this until... You, you have a speck of paper that's so small, it doesn't even matter at this point. That it, like, after a hundred cuts, a thousand cuts, a million cuts, that you'll have a paper, a piece of paper, a tiny piece, that is so small, you can really just disregard it. It sounds careless to say, you know, you can just forget about this extra piece, but uh, that's, that's a lot of what, you know, calculus is, is saying, you know, what if, what, you know, what if we... For, you know, kept going smaller. It. Yeah. What if we what if we keep going smaller beyond what's really you know possible and study the behavior of those things? So I think you know even yeah you know, I think anyone can kind of understand that like you know the runner's paradox doesn't really make that much sense, right? If as anyone who's ever walked anywhere, right? If if anyone who's ever traveled to any place before at all will realize that yes, you can get to your destination, right? It happens because you have to recognize that a half plus a quarter, plus an eighth, plus a sixteenth, on and on, you'll eventually get to one. I mean, to be fair, there is, yeah, I mean, to, uh, about the runner's paradox, right? There is this mathematical point where, yes, walking a distance takes a certain amount of time and you're walking infinite pieces of distance, but also those infinite pieces 
take an infinitely shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter time. Mm. So the actual time is finite, right? It seems strange that like an infinite sequence of numbers can add up to something finite. Um, but there are such things such as infinite series where they either converge, meaning they end up going on a value, or they diverge, meaning they blow up to infinity or negative infinity, or they don't actually get to a finite point. Um, just like a brief mathematical aside, a, one of the so the two kind of stereotypical things are um, in ter- demonstrating like a convergent series, which is something that co- goes to a single number oh, versus is this, divergent. Is this the, the, the Mandelbrot set? Is it is not the Mandelbrot oh. set. It is not the Mandelbrot set. That's a little bit so, difficult to describe over radio. That's yeah. That one takes. It's a little too dis- difficult to describe. Period. Yeah. Um, but regardless. Yeah, we're not talking about that. Uh, about convergent and divergent sets, a convergent set, a uh, very famous one, is actually one we were talking about, one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. And you can see it's you know just getting multiplying by half every time. So it's one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, one sixty fourth, on and on into infinity, actually adds up to one. Like it adds up to a finite number. Um, you can demonstrate this by just taking, like Carter said, a piece of paper and cutting it in halves and those halves and halves and those halves and halves and halves on and on. And you see that when you put it all together, you have an infinite series of halves that add up to one whole paper. Uh, however, this is not the case with other numbers, such as uh, one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth plus one sixth plus one seventh plus one eighth, all these like integer numbers. If you keep going on to infinity, that actually does not converge. It is not finite. It actually blows up onto infinity, like all the way. And it's it's a, like a strange idea that some of these uh, series like converge, some of these diverge up to infinity. Um, and I mean, th- that part of math is just uh, a little bit painful, but it's just something that you have to learn to prove. Unfortunately, I don't think Zeno knew about uh, calculus because it had not been invented and would not be invented for quite a while until I think Newton and Leibniz were on the scene. Um, mm, regardless, this, this was mm-hmm. one of the shortcomings of a lot of the ancient Greeks. They couldn't time travel. That's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, how would the world be different if the ancient Greeks could time travel? If Quite. you guys could actually go back to the ancient Greeks and tell them like one idea, just one concept from the modern world. Pop-tarts. Relativity. <laughs> Pop-tarts. I stand by my decision. <laughs> Pop-tarts are great. I, I think it, it would have <laughs> revel. <laughs> um, I love both of these examples because in both of them they'd have no context or understanding of either of these ideas. Like Absolutely they'd have no nothing. toaster to make pop tarts and thus rendering the pop tarts useless. Well, also, they'd not be able to manufacture pop tarts because it's all like almost all artificial. What do you mean? It's all <laughs> it's off the tree, <laughs> straight off the tree. Yeah, um, exactly. and then yeah, I takes a little bit anyways so that's you know mm. um i mean these these kind of his idea about like movement being impossible i feel like it's a little similar to uh oh who was it beforehand that we were talking about uh earlier today earlier today there was someone that just talked about you know everything being static and like not moving aha uh-huh. yes that was uh that was uh oh uh, parmenides that's the guy oh yes my fault. Yes, but speaking of math, I think we should move on. <laughs> move on to our final, our final uh, subject for the evening. Oh, this guy's a this, this guy's a huge math guy, isn't he? Oh He's yeah, huge. big into the math things. Charlie, you you want to introduce one last time? Who are we talking about this time? You know him. You love him. You've used his theorem. You've used mm-hmm. his his namesake. And you might use it in your everyday life. I mean, a lot of people say they don't, but I think you might. His name is Pythagoras. Boom. Oh. oh Pythagoras. You mean, you mean like of the theorem? Of the theorem. He the, was the guy. The man himself. He said A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Mm. And the world went silent. I think that, <laughs> you know, a lot of people... Don't appreciate how much he affected LeBron James' legacy, mm. uh, especially so in his later true. years. So um, true. A lot of people don't understand that he used Pythagorean's theorem in his uh, in his uh, in his finals performances. Uh, mm. Anyways, up until Socrates, he's probably the most influential philosopher. Interesting. So we know we know about the math, right? We know the about math. the math. Yes, the math that's and, the, the the foundation of trigonometry and right. calculus and and all advanced math, pretty much. You know, even elementary schoolers understand. 
this formula. So, so but about the so about the philosophical side, right? Yeah. What, what did he, what did Pythagoras have to offer? Well, you're gonna love it when I say it, uh, Carter. But uh, he loved math. That was his thing. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> he uh, he thought that math was the universe and the only thing to describe the universe. Uh, his his motto for his school, uh, the Pythagorean school of thought, was "All is number." Mm, all is all our numbers, however you want to say it. Mm-hmm. What does that mean, though? What, what does it mean to say all all is number? When you look at the stars, even they were all at that point described to a T by mathematics. By mathematics, when you look at the way balls drop. When you look at the way triangles behave and the way circles are formed, the way surface tension works, all of those things are numbers, or mm-hmm. should can, can be, be described can be described by numbers. And so his idea was that clearly this is something divine, something inherent to the universe. And so he, his entire school was basically worshiping math. And uh, I should I should say, he was a very mythologized person. He was very legendary, and a lot of a lot of people are unsure whether he existed or not. Um, in the way we know him as a you know leader of many and all of that, so um, um, he was the leader of his school, right? Yeah, but I mean. After his po- posthumously, he was a lot of people were like, "I'm a Pyth- I'm a Pythagorean," but just because of the weight it carried, and also because of the legacy of Pythagoras. An example of this mythologization is when he <laughs> apparently at a I'm not sure it was an Olympic game, but it was it was a game, it was a sporting event. He was chilling right at the sporting event, mm-hmm. as you do at sporting events, right? And you're watching it, and an eagle flew up and landed on his arm. And everyone in the audience yelled, Hail Pythagoras. And then shortly thereafter, a river bubbled up with the words in it, Hail Pythagoras. So, you know, pretty fantastical. So you can see why people were like a little skeptical in the modern age of if this guy was real. Um, what do you also, mean? That sounds perfectly possible and legitimate. No, I, I think that, you know, a lot of people uh, would say that. But um, Regardless. Regardless. To answer your question, all is number. So then, my question with that is: What would Pythagoras say? You know, if if I if I get a, I don't know if I get a test back, right, and it's a bad test, and I feel sad, how is that a number, right? Like, like, am I feeling twelve sad? Like, how is that quantified? How's how's that you know how is that a number? Those internal emotional things. Carter, you got you got neurotransmitters, don't you? You got dopamine. I you think, got endorphins. I think you got all these things that regulate your emotions. Yeah, you have a certain number of these things that regulate your emotions. Uh huh. So you have a certain number of things that control exactly what you feel. So your emotions are controlled, what by numbers? Hmm. Well, but I mean, there's no way to know how many. Like I don't know how many neurotransmitters I have. I don't you know. You could know. Ex- I could. You could. I mean, it's not like it's impo- It's not like it's a physics thing where oh, it's impossible to know like uncertainty principle or whatever. Like we just, I'm sorry to say it, but like m- the medical world just hasn't put in the effort to discover the amount of neurotransmitters in your mm. brain. Lazy. But I don't know why. Why. <laughs> I think it's a little hard. <laughs> it's a little challenge. <laughs> it's a little hard, but it's certainly <laughs> possible. Definitely. And so it is possible for everything to be described by number. Interesting. Interesting. I forgot to say this, but also he believed in reincarnation. So uh, all of his followers were vegetarians, and they didn't eat beans. Because beans look like fetuses. Mm. And they might have little bodies in them, so you can't eat beans. Hmm. That's a take. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a new one, for sure. <laughs> You've heard of uh, pro-life, pro-choice. Now get ready for pro-bean. <laughs> pro-bean. <laughs> oh, Lord. Anyways. Um, just to add another like myth to the mythology of Pythagoras. I do remember one uh, one little detail about his 
uh, well about his Pythagorean theorem. Um, this isn't as philosophical, but it does describe kind of the man he was described to be uh, in that, you know, one day while he was out on a boat, someone actually asked him about, you know, he had come up with his Pythagorean theorem and everything. Uh, someone asked him about the triangle one and with eggs length one and one. And if you do the math, right, a squared plus b squared, you get that a squared plus b squared is one plus one, which is two. And so two is, and so c squared is two. So there's some number squared, which ends up being two. Mm -hmm. And in our modern day, we just call that, oh, the square root of two. And it ends up being 1.414, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, back then, there was no square root. I mean, there was no even concept of numbers that just kept going. There was no concept of these numbers that couldn't be described in like fractions and parts. There was no concept of a number that couldn't be, uh, as you described it in mathematics, rational. Right. And so Pythagoras was actually uh, scared um, and he, mm. in, well, I mean, scared and also kind of angered that this guy would even ask him such a, such a question. And so the myth um, is that Pythagoras ordered his followers to throw the guy who asked about the, uh, the triangle overboard and let him drown in the sea. His name was Hippasus. Hippasus. Hippasus? Hippasus. Mm. We love suppressing dissenters. I love it. That's <laughs> what happened with Socrates. And I think we'll talk about him next week. Socrates. We have him next week with a special guest. Yep, that's right. We'll have a, a secret uh, yep. special co-host. Co Ooh. Ooh. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do it. We have three mics. Uh, I'll figure something out. We'll figure something out. Interesting. Anyways. Yep. Uh, we will Welcome back. You're listening to WPEA 90.5 FM, Exeter. This is School of Athens. I'm your co-host, Avik Wadavkar. I'm Carter Otis. And I'm Charlie Scales. All right. Well, I mean, we are at just nearing the top of the hour. Can we get a brief summary over what and who we went over? We started out today with some... Um, the first Greek philosopher of all time, uh, Thales of Miletus. He invents math. He believes that humans came out of water. He didn't believe that the gods made us, which was kind of cool at the time. Um, another thing we forgot to talk about, he's one of the ancient seven sages of ancient Greece. There were seven mythical figures throughout all of Greece in ancient Greece. Uh, Socrates referred to him, Plato referred to him, Aristotle referred to him, and for instance, all we know about him is from Plato. Anyways, he's a pretty cool dude, uh, 7th to 6th century, basically. Anaximander, his student, same story, 7th to 6th century, at this time, late 7th to 6th century. Um, Thales' student, fire and water, natural selection, all that. Heraclitus. <laughs> I'm kind of going a little quick here, but... Eh, it's fine. Anyways, the Heraclitus... He thinks that the universe is constantly changing. We talked about a little bit of law there. Uh, he was in the 6th century to the 5th century. And then we have Parmenides. He says the opposite thing. He said, well, first he was the first ontologist, basically saying, talking about being and existence, but then that everything was and will be all the time and that nothing changes ever. Anyways, uh, Zeno of Alea. Invented a bunch of paradoxes, like the runner's paradox, where you can't run somewhere because you'll you'll go infinitely. Um, paradox of Achilles, where the tortoise always gets ahead, such and such. Talked a little about limits and and uh, calculus. I don't know how we got there. Pythagoras. Oh, yeah, that was my fault. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's valuable. Pythagoras, uh, we all know him, we all love him. He invented the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, another thing we, we touched on at the end was he who's a vegetarian. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And he uh, an eagle landed on his arm and stuff, so that was pretty cool. Mm, yeah, and his idea that everything is made of numbers, that the universe is but purely math. And that That's know, right. There's, there's nothing more, there's no soul, there's no consciousness, there's no self, it's just numbers. Anyways, yeah, that is all of our pre-Socratic philosophers. Join us next week as we talk about Socrates, the man himself. Who is